Hello and a very good morning to you. Welcome to this first in a series of events by the European Liberal Forum. We're entitled Science Not Fiction because if you're like me, you love a bit of science fiction. And of course, one of the most exciting things about reading about future or near future novels and fiction is the possibility that these inventions and societies that they discuss may come true. And indeed that has happened. Good and bad, we've seen science fiction authors predict all sorts of things from Asimov's satellites to George Orwell's 1984. So we're going to dwell today on digital and all the positive potential outcomes that could arise when we look at what's possible and what could be in our near future. Today's event is sponsored by Qualcomm and Apple, so thank you very much to them. Now, there are various tools at your disposal here on our site today. You can join the networking area where you can talk to fellow participants and maybe speculate about what we will see in the coming weeks, years and months. Or you can go to the expo area where you will find the ELF booth. So please, if you have time, do check that out. Now, we're being broadcast live on Facebook. You will also find this on the ELF website and later on as it's being recorded on the ELF YouTube channel. So please do that. Please also tweet, share on social media, spread the word using the hashtags ELF event or hashtag science not fiction. Now we have some great speakers for you today. It's going to be quite rapid fire so I hope everyone's had plenty of coffee this morning and is wide awake and we hope we will be able to bring everything to you in a very timely fashion. Unfortunately we're having some glitches with our very first speaker on the agenda, Svenja Han. She's here, she's just tried to connect. So we're gonna come back to Svenja in a little bit, but we are going to dive straight into setting the scene with Gerd Leonhardt, the futurist and humanist author and CEO of the Futures Agency. Gerd, lovely to see you again. Um, let's start. It's uh, We're gonna talk about science, not fiction. Um, why are we looking at what's in front of us and not two or three steps ahead? Yes, good morning, everybody. It's a great pleasure. I'm, I'm here in Zurich, as you can see. This is not real, but it's pretty nice. <laughs> so, uh, well, science fiction, well, basically what's happening is that uh, humans are, uh, generally speaking, not so good at looking at things that don't immediately impact them. You know, I always say we only change because of pain or love. Uh, and that's been historically true with the nuclear bomb, the financial crisis 2007, and of course, COVID, right? But one thing that we've learned in the COVID crisis is that we must anticipate and prepare uh, if we are not going to be suffering major proportions of disaster. So this is a big learning from the crisis. You know, now we're putting real time and thinking and, and people are now saying basically COVID-19 was a test run for climate change, right? So, and this is triggering real action. So we are getting much better at foresight and the future is already here. We just have to take note, right? And, and this has a, been a very good learning. So I think what we're going to do now in the next 10 years, fundamental change of policy uh, and discussion about what we need to do to have what I call a good future. Uh, and, and this is now moving center stage as science fiction is actually becoming science fact, right? That is so much the truth. You know, when we look at things like 5G or the cloud or intelligent assistance and you know that stuff was yeah it was theory until now and now it's getting real well i thought there for a moment you were going to give us the uh, the famous william gibson quote one of my favorite sci-fi authors who says the future is already here it's just not very evenly distributed <laughs> i have a much better quote actually let's take this one from eo wilson who says the problem of humanity is that we have paleolithic emotions medieval institutions and godlike technology. <laughs> and okay, that, that is, that is so, a good so true, right? <laughs> well, let's talk about these some of these technologies. You know, there's a lot of things already on the horizon, augmented reality, Neuralink, quantum computing, a big one that we think may deliver leaps and bounds in change uh, for in terms of what we can do with this godlike uh, technology. Uh, Internet of Things, 6G, facial recognition. I mean, where do you see these uh, technologies fitting easily into our daily lives? And, and what are the problems with them? Because there are certainly some concerns. Yeah, I think, you know, technology and science in general have pretty much all the tools to solve our practical problems. And that is communications, media, energy, water, food, you know, I mean, we're looking at plant-based food now taken over from meat, right? 
I mean, mind-boggling change. And now meat is made in the lab, you know, with uh, cultured meat. And Bill Gates and Richard Branson are involved in saying that maybe in 10 years that meat will be one-tenth of the price of, of a dead cow, so to speak, right? So this is all happening right now. The problem with technology is that technology will never solve cultural, political, and human problems. It will make them worse, right? Because technology is an efficiency engine, right? And this is why we need to get uh, together and say, okay, we have the power of technology. Now, what about the power of the right policy? The, so I always say, you know, we, we will have all the tools, but will we have the telos, you know, the Greek word, which is wisdom and purpose. And, and this is what we need to do right now, because we can indeed use technology to solve all that stuff, but we have to make the right decisions in terms of distributing the benefit of technology, right? Uh, if we don't do that, then we're going to end up in a place where, yeah, it's the people who that own the tech that are going to be in good shape and everybody else is like racing behind. Yeah. And that well, needs to be changed. I mean, since we're talking quotes, let's quote Kranzberg's first law, which is technology is neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral, which is this way of saying it's all in the hands of the creator. There we go. Um, yeah. Europe is making this big push for citizen-centric technology. I mean, explain what that means, really, because a lot of people just think, does that mean putting the human at the center of it? Does that mean just making it useful, user-friendly? How, how do we turn that into something that is meaningfully ethical and meaningfully supportive of the sort of society we want to have? Well, since Apple is one of the sponsors of this event, I quote Tim Cook, who said something very smart. Uh, him generally being a smart quoter, he says, okay, uh, technology can do great things, but it does not want to do great things. It doesn't want anything, right? And there brings me to this uh, scene that I use, oops, sorry, I don't want to do that, um, where basically uh, technology has all of those cards, right? And we have those cards, like we have values and ethics. And, <laughs> and so technology doesn't understand values and ethics. It doesn't care. You know, these are like murky human things. And, and, and in many ways, in Silicon Valley, you have this understanding that the problem really is the humans, right? Because we are the problem in this, in this perfect world of technology. And we have to turn that around and we have to use a different approach, which I call this here. Yeah? I'll change the background so you can see this. Right? People, planet, purpose, and prosperity. Right? And if that is not going to be our paradigm, and people called that people, planet, profit, you know, 20 years ago, mm -hmm. but enlarging a little bit, then we have a problem, a disconnect, which says we can make lots of money with technology, we can fix everything, but the purpose will not be available for everybody. Right? And we're going to end up in a world that's totally po polarized, and, and that needs to be addressed. Well, the final question I wanted to ask you was about what if we leave the monopoly of innovation to countries that don't share our values, or parts of the world that don't share our values. I suppose in some ways we're thinking about China in the US and Europe are fairly still fairly close in terms of defining what they, 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 their principles are as democracy. <laughs> so far. Yeah, and, <laughs> yeah. I, I think you'd be surprised to see that actually on a global scale, the most basic values are largely shared by everybody. Um, and that includes, when I talk about basic values, I'm not talking about having a house or a car or religion, right? I'm talking about being alive, <laughs> having a right to bring your kids into a better world, being educated, having civil rights, and 98% of the world would agree on what those things are, you know, what a good future is and what a not so good future is, no matter whether you're in China or Arkansas or, or Brazil, right? Um, and so I think we can actually agree on many of those things, like we can agree when there's pressure, we're going to agree on what we want to achieve together. Maybe we can't agree on, you know, on brain computer interfaces or automated drones killing machines, you know, that, that those are discussions, right? But generally ag agreeing on the most basic principle, which is to further human flourishing. I think we do agree on that. I mean, one thing that tends to get people to agree is an external threat. I mean, perhaps if the aliens arrived, we'll, we'll all band together and use the tech in a useful <laughs> way. <laughs> True. <laughs> One final um, just thought uh, that I'd be interested to hear your ideas on. It, do you feel there's an idea that if something's invented, it will eventually spread everywhere around the world, regardless? You know, we invented fire. It, it's not just going to stay. I mean, we talk about there being no borders, but I mean, really, in a, a sort of overall principle that all technology will eventually be everywhere. Yeah, but, you know, it's, it's part of the thinking. And this is why I use the fork in the road concept, you know, 
uh, it's kind of the thinking that the future is happening regardless of what we want. And that is just complete garbage, right? Basically, we create the future, right? Every action we take, every inaction, and we make decisions about what is okay and what is not every day. And the future isn't just dropping down on us and technology will not just happen just because it exists, right? So yes, people will do all kinds of bizarre things with technology, including, you know, falling in love with a robot and what have you. But in the end, yeah, we're going to have a social contract, we're going to have regulation, we're going to have agreement on the basic cornerstones of this. And this is what humans are good at when they are forced to do so, right? Uh, so I would say the future is coming faster than we think, the future is better than we think, and the future is more designable than we tend to think. Final question then, what technology are you most excited about for the future and why, be it blockchain, CRISPR, quantum? Do you have a favorite? Yeah, there, there's a whole collection. Yeah, I'm, I'm really most excited about technology solving our energy problem at this point because we are going to decarbonize the world uh, in the next decade and the technology is there. All we have to do is pour money on it, you know, like we did with COVID, you know, <laughs> and, and this is what we're doing now. I mean, I'm really excited about essentially energy will become as abundant as music uh, on the internet, right? And we're all going to pay, we're all going to have uh, uh, the benefit of that, and that will change our world completely to the positive. Good. Thank you very much. A pleasure as always to speak to you. We've Thank you. To do that very quickly, but that's the plan <laughs> for this morning to get through lightning talks at lightning speed, and so we can pack as many ideas in as possible. Gerd Leonard, a futurist, Gen ladies and gentlemen, do look out for him. Follow him online, and remember to keep sharing our comments today using the hashtag Science Not Fiction and ELF event. I'm going to introduce you now to another speaker, another innovator who's going to give us a lightning talk. So please do welcome Hans Christian Bose, who's the CEO of Argo. Uh, Hans Christian, are you there? Can we see you? Um, and, and actually, in reaction to Hans Christian, I also want to introduce Eva Jabs from the European Parliament Renew Europe group. Eva, are you there as well? Thank you very much, because I want to be able to see your reactions to Hans Christian's comments. So Hans Christian, I'm going to, uh, first question I'm going to actually ask you is, uh, what did you think of Gert's comments? Well, it's very interesting. I mean, he's totally right. It's us building the future and it's not, the future is not happening to us, right? It's nothing that, that we are not involved in. I think that's the most important part. A lot of, a lot of things that you see going wrong are because people are waiting for the future to happen. Okay, and tell us, what are you working on currently? Um, well, I, I have three topics. One is the long-running one, which is artificial intelligence and uh, automation through artificial intelligence. I'm, I'm trying to make that future of work that's been discussed so much happen um, by experience from people, putting into a machine and multiply people. Um, so that this is the long-running goal, um, move from an industrial to a knowledge economy. And the, the core topics that I'm on are uh, pandemic management, as you would uh, <laughs> see. I think it's really important for our digital solutions for dealing with the long term of the pandemic are not very good. And I think the topic uh, it should be individual risk management to blanket risk management, decide on lockdown or no lockdown. We should know we should go from an individual risk and, and see how can we mitigate that and get it down? Um, and the second one is on um, um, making digital twins of arts and collectible goods uh, uh, on the large data sphere great. that we use for the artificial intelligence uh, in order to create new income streams for museums and artists who haven't had a great in the last top couple of years. So, and, those are so I mean, what are the big problems? Yeah, I mean, what are the big problems and the challenges, though, within those topics that you're running into? Well, I would say, um, oddly enough, uh, you, you have not sitting here saying, I'm, I've got to give and everything is going wrong and there's not much, enough money from the state. That's totally not the problem at all. The real problem is, is the mindset change that is necessary, right? If we want all these futuristic things to happen, um, we need a, a different mindset. And the mindset currently is uh, uh, curiosity last, um, total security first, um, and the mindset that we have now also is that 
people who try something uh, uh, have basically no incentive to do so because it's threatening their own careers and, and so on. So it's it's a true mindset problem that we have. And I think it's not the regulations or anything. Our, our regulatory framework is okay. I mean, it can always be improved and I've got many jobs with this, but the real big problem is the mindset problem. And I think that this is a, should be part of the political discussion. Um, how can we change that? And how can politics, who is in front of TV cameras and uh, uh, social media and so on every day work on shifting the mindset into forward going rather than keeping what we've already achieved. Well, then my final question is what does the, the perfect innovation friendly environment look like to you? And so presumably it's, it's more about that mindset change rather than simply just new tools or, or new uh, regulations that or, or even financing, I suppose, that, that might help. Well, I, um, currently financing out of Europe is very difficult, right? And it's not difficult because there's no money. In fact, there's probably more state money than anywhere else except for China. Um, but the, the real point is that how do we get entrepreneurship back on, on the table? And I think this is very difficult because um, even the, the European capital, um, there's lots of it. If they go looking for innovation, they start investing in Silicon Valley funds. And why do they do that? Because the Valley funds actually make decisions. They don't try to all the time cover their asses uh, and, and be 100% right. They actually make leaps uh, and back them and love them. And when they die, they're sad, uh, uh, but they don't, don't go after the people who tried with a big gun, right? So that's, for me, the innovation setup truly has something to do with the mindset, but it also has something to do with the climate of financing um, that, that we put onto people. Um, and I would say that, that we really have um, a, a day worth of strength that we have in Europe and we're not using them. So on a perfect innovation in a perfect innovation for environment for me would be something where um, we had our own funds that were investing uh, in the venture business. We had our own funds that would be investing into growth business. Not everything needs to be state backed, um, but it needs to be attractive for the people putting capital there. It needs to be attract more attractive than putting their money with the, for example, Valley funds. The second thing is we need the mindset shift. Um, if you try something, you fail, it needs to be rewarded that you tried. Um, and the third one is we need to make our diversity a strength, uh, not a weakness. Currently, it's a weakness. If I want to hire talent across Europe, um, then I, I have to open subsidiaries in every country and uh, or use very expensive service providers. Um, it should be easy to hire, like have a remote incorporated um, so I could hire anywhere in Europe um, with people staying wherever they are and uh, being attached to their social system because they want to be. So those well, three things, I think if we can get those done, Europe is a very good environment because we have talent, we have people who feel safe, we have uh, tradition and so on, but we have to move, start moving forward. Well, Chris, I mean, some things we may have learned from the pandemic, and one is that certainly we can work remotely if there's enough will to do it. Um, Europe's working on various legislation around posted workers directive and so on. So if I was, I'm going to come to you then and get your reactions to what you've just heard, some real world examples. Um, you know, you're the MEP here. Tell us what you can do. And what you yes, can. Uh, thank you very much. Well, uh, it's really a, a, a big honor to be on a panel with such a distinguished expert as Chris. And I think what he said uh, is very relevant for what we are doing actually here in the European Parliament, especially we liberals in the European Parliament, because, OK, we all know that Europe is lagging behind in terms of, of innovation, digital innovation uh, behind the US and China. And of course, what, what we can do on the one hand, and of course, there is this mentality is very much widespread. What Chris said, this curiosity last, security first. Yes, there is a strong uh, tendency to, to over-regulate many things. And the regulatory framework is right now on the table, as you probably know, and we are fighting uh, about it. On the other hand, of course, the EU is doing a lot of things in order to promote uh, innovation. And, uh, and this 
since this is what I'm working with, is of course the Horizon Program and the European Innovation Council, European Institute of Innovation and Technology, and so on and so forth, in order to, well, this Horizon has been also developing uh, a, a lot in a sense that we are thinking very much about the things what uh, Chris just said about the involvement of entrepreneurship, uh, competitiveness, and promoting creativity in a very broad sense. In that sense, of course, Europe has still to think about many things. If, as far as I understand, Chris has been working also with the Corona apps, uh, which was a big issue, as you probably remember, last year. And what we saw with Corona apps that we didn't get one interoperable Corona app for all the EU, this is a shame. This is a shame, and this is really a failure of how the EU should work as a common research area and a common research space. On the other hand, of course, what EU is different, in what sense EU is different from uh, the US, let's say, we are still very much multi-centric. This is still 27 countries, and our biggest task is actually to get this creativity and the potential out of all uh, countries and all the member states, because the talents are everywhere. Thank you. I, I, I do. No, I was on mute and I say it a hundred times a day to other people and then I did it myself. Oh, well, <laughs> uh, the, the human really is the weak link here in this. All right. Um, let's uh, let's hear now from Svenja. I think Svenja is connected. Uh, your colleague in the European Parliament, that is uh, Svenja Han, who is a member of the New Europe Group and first vice president of the European Liberal Forum. Svenja, are you there? Do we have, yes, wonderful, we can see you and hopefully in a moment we'll be able to hear you. Um, I think, there you are, great. <laughs> oh God, definitely having issues with that this morning. Well, with that, Chris, Chris Evaz, thank you very much. Um, I've enjoyed our brief lightning talk um, and I take away all your points. I'm sure I'll be putting them to other guests during the rest of the day. Uh, well, we're here until about 11, but we'll be talking about this for a lot of times to come. Svenja, I think since we're still having issues with you, what we'll do now is we have a video from the European Commissioner Maria Gabriel that she has very kindly recorded for us and sent to us today. So I think we'll go and have a look at that video while we try and iron out the various other technological gremlins. And of course, do let me encourage you to keep sharing online ELF event and science not fiction are your two hashtags. Svenja, I can see you, so you can give us a wave, <laughs> but I'm afraid we can't hear you. Well, there you go. Communication is, is, only, uh, is only a small percentage verbal, so I think we can see that you're listening, you're joining us, you're happy with it, you, you're, you're, you're impressed with what you're hearing, thumbs up all around, okay. There you go, that's that's the, uh, the sort of introduction we want, just two big thumbs up, if only all events were like this. Thank you very much, Tanya. Uh, let us turn now to that video from Maria Gabriel. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to start by thanking the European Liberal Forum for inviting me to participate at this conference. I concur with the motto of the conference today, science, not fiction. We indeed need to work together to ensure that science and innovation is not fictional. On the contrary, we should make innovation as the spin of our societies. To reach this goal, we need to build a true pan-European innovation ecosystem where innovative ideas, financial support, customers and exit opportunities are flourishing anywhere in Europe and flowing from one place to another. This pan-European innovation ecosystem will ensure the right level of investment in talent and skills and in the new generation of innovators all across Europe. I agree with you that we need to ensure that Europe is not a continent of passive users, but on the contrary, Europe becomes the global powerhouse of innovation and startups. I want to boost Europe's innovation performance and address persistent problems hindering innovation such as insufficient transfer of new technologies from research to market, lack of risk finance for companies to scale up fast, 
disconnected local innovation ecosystems, fragmentation of the internal market and regulatory burden, and the business environment and culture that is more risk-averse and less conducive to innovation. A particular challenge for Europe is the need to increase innovation cohesion that perseveres between regions, including rural areas, due to uneven diffusion of knowledge and innovation policies that are not sufficiently place-sensitive and adapted to the specific characteristics of different countries and regions. At the same time, the nature and sources of innovation are changing. Disruptive innovations are appearing in all fields and startups, in particular deep tech startups, are emerging as key players. We are witnessing a next wave of innovation based on deep tech and new combinations of scientific knowledge and technologies and the rise of superstar firms. And innovation is increasingly coming from sources other than research and researchers, be it from entrepreneurs, end users, citizens, students, or just a collaboration among the actors of the innovation ecosystems. Allow me to insist here that at the core of this innovation ecosystem should be the education system. From primary and secondary, Europeans should learn about innovation and the positive impact it can have on our societies. In addition, higher education institutions should include more innovative and multidisciplinary teaching and learning approaches, better integration within innovation ecosystems, increased circulation of knowledge and entrepreneurial talent. My objective is to deliver the innovation needed for a sustainable and resilient recovery from the pandemic, for accelerating the green and digital transitions, and for securing the technological sovereignty of Europe. For this, we count on many instruments, including the European Innovation Council, the European Institute of Innovation and Technology, the European Innovation Ecosystem Programme, and European University Alliances, just to mention a few. But this work can only be done if we all work together. I would be delighted to receive the ideas from the members of the European Liberal Forum in the co-creation process of a pan-European innovation ecosystem that will ensure that innovation is ingrained in the European society. You can count on me. I trust I can count on your support to put innovation at the center of the European policies. Thank you for your attention. Absolutely. And of course, we thank the Commissioner for taking the time to send that message to us, having read and really considered what we're trying to talk about here today. Now joining us, we have another question about how to make this fiction a reality. And joining me from Facebook, it's the Head of EU Affairs and Public Policy Director, Aura Sala, and also from DG Connect, uh, the Department in the European Commission there of Commissioner Gabriel. We have Zoran Astantic, who is a Special Advisor in DG Connect. Um, are we there? Are we both got both my speakers ready to go? All right, great. I can see you. Very nice to see you again. It's been nice a little while. You. Um, now, uh, Zoran, are you there as well? Because uh, I want to see your reactions to what Aura has to tell us about. Um, hi, hi, there we go. Wonderful. Okay. Oh. Um, so the big question, or let me start with you, is how to make this fiction a reality. Um, the question, is Europe innovation friendly? That is a really important and big question, because as we all know, we all want to see European digital champions, right? I come from Finland and we used to have one great digital champion coming from my country and we were super proud of them. Uh, and we would like to see more of this. Even I'm representing here American uh, company. Uh, so still, I think that there needs to be room to innovate in, in Europe. As you know, we as a company, we have long argued uh, for new regulation uh, on privacy, elections, harmful content, uh, data portability. Uh, we are doing our utmost best to keep our services safe and tackle hate speeds and so on. However, we don't think that private companies should be doing this alone. We really need democratically elected decision makers, politicians, uh, to, to do uh, real regulation on, on this. 
However, when we do this, there needs to be space for innovation to happen. Uh, also in Europe. Otherwise, we will see that only happening in China and in the United States. And it's great uh, for us as Europeans that we are, it's really rooted in our thinking and, and these, these regulatory proposals, our values, free expression, privacy, transparency, uh, and rights of individuals. And these values, they must be protected. I think we all agree here. But, uh, and I also think that it's important that we will have greater trans, uh, transparency and accountability um, that actually runs through much of these proposed legislations at the moment. And then we hope that the European Parliament and also the European Council will, will stick to that. However, of course, there needs to be a balance uh, between privacy and safety, and it's not easy. And maybe my last point I want to I wanna say here is that we need to still see seamless data flows around the world because that's the basis of an open internet, right? Uh, it's super important that our data is safe. And as we saw here also, it also comes back to us individuals using different platforms and, and services on internet, right? However, uh, protectionism is something that we don't want to see in Europe because otherwise we will not have those digital champions here in our own continent. So, and what's your reaction to that? Now, some of these things I'm sure you've heard of before, there's, there's a fear about protectionism, there's a, a push for there to be regulation with teeth, but not too much. What, where, do you, where do your responses, what are your responses on, on that question about how innovation friendly Europe really is? No, I, uh, thank you very much for organizing this event. I really appreciate it because you're putting the focus on the right issues. So I, I think, first of all, we have to be very proud of the way we do our policies, we as European Union. What do I mean by that? I mean, the way we conduct, uh, you know, different kind of uh, discussions with stakeholders before we table the proposal proposals is very, very inclusive, you know. So I want to insist that our European way of doing regulation is inclusive and therefore also ready we are ready to we are making the right innovations in the right time second thing which i think several of the speakers before including aura mentioned earlier we are we, we we have our own values and we are very proud of those values so the way we regulate has has to kind of mirror those values uh, and uh, i think it's also very important to to note that um, we as European Union, we are trying to avoid hard regulation whenever it's possible. I mean, just look at recently adopted guidelines for code of practice for this, on this information, where actually we avoid hard regulation and we actually go for the soft regulation whenever it can, it, it, it can work. Then if the soft regulation and co-regulation doesn't work, then of course we have to do the hard regulation. And here, I think we are doing very innovative approaches, we as European Union. I mean, just let me remind you on GDPR, we are just celebrating third year of GDPR and with the GDPR, we have really championed new way of regulation throughout the, European, throughout the world and other countries are also following us. Something similar is happen happening, for example, in the domain of the uh, artificial intelligence. Just a couple of weeks ago, we have adopted a proposal uh, for regulation of the AI, where we actually we have proposed clearly areas which should be banned uh, for using AI. And of course, we have different grades of sensitivities. And for those risky, uh, less risky areas, we have more space for the way we can regulate it. So I'm trying to illustrate that, you know, uh, sitting on the chairs of, of, of the commission, we try to embed innovation also in the way we prepare regulation. And also very importantly, as it has been mentioned earlier, we have to have means for regulating, for, for uh, implementing our regulation uh, innovation. And uh, this is why we have uh, either Horizon Europe or Digital Europe program. We also have the Recovery and Resilience Fund, uh, which has been just uh, 
starting to put in, put in place according to the national progress of the member states. So I, I want to insist that, yes, we have challenges, you know, yes, there are specific issues regarding, I mean, let's be also frank, different uh, approaches regarding uh, privacy uh, in Europe and in United States, you know, or not to mention other, other parts of the world, you know, where we are, you know, worlds apart, you know, the United States were very close, but there are nuances where we are different, you know, and in a way we have to, to see how we are going to do it right on European level and also try to find worldwide solutions whenever that's possible. Well, you mentioned there AI and, and the, the current risk-based approach that we know the European Commission is taking. Do you think, uh, or that this is the right approach, are we ready for the next digital revolution in a way that makes consumers, citizens, as, as well as, as organizations and innovators feel safe? I mean, this is very risky thing, you know, whenever regulation comes too early, it will, of course, limit the innovation, you know. So we as, as, as uh, regulators, uh, together with the council and the parliament, should not kind of run too fast, you know, we should see what's happening. We should then have very profound discussions with different stakeholders in Europe, with businesses, with civil society, with uh, entrepreneurs. We should proceed because, you know, if we rush into regulation too fast, this will not be good for, 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 uh, for our competitiveness in the world, you know. But how... You know, several members of the parliament you, uh, earlier said, uh, you know, we have to see how we actually can um, can innovate, you know, how we can use our funds, which are uh, extensive, but at the same time, how to fight the fragmentation, which we have in European Union, you know, and the, the, the way forward is, of course, by working closely, closer together, by combining different funds, which we have, by looking together with the member states, what can be done by, you know, this digital, really acting digital single market, and so on. So I think that this is the main challenge, which, which, uh, which I see it. Thank you. Um, Aura, same sort of question to you. Are we ready for this next digital revolution? Um, is the legislation ready? Is Europe ready? Are citizens ready? Yeah, thank you. This is an excellent question. I would argue saying that we really don't have a digital single market. I'm sorry. We have been working on this for decades and still the market is so fragmented. And I know that we are not uh, talking about digital single market anymore, a separate digital single market. It's one single market, but it is fragmented. Try to come from the US to Europe or build some uh, super innovative scale up in Slovenia and enter to the market in, in the EU. It's impossible. You are still facing 27 different regulations. And now I would argue also that because the EU is so slow, actually proposing and implementing, and I'm putting the emphasis on the word implement, implementation also, different rules for internet. That's why the member states are already doing their own regulation. Hate speech in, in Germany, in France, for example. And now if we, if we will not get, let's say, digital taxation right, OECD level or at the European Union level, uh, we will lose this game because member states, they will not wait they will propose, they will implement their, their own legislation. And here I think that the European legislators really need to speed up to make sure that we will have this one market that it's not uh, fragmented. Because what we, what we want is, uh, I think everyone here agrees, uh, op open and, and universally accessible internet. And I think, yes, the EU is leading the way on regulation, but we need to also lead the way to have this uh, uh, this to get this internet regulation right globally. Yes, uh, we need to we need to think about the safety. We need to think about respect of, for human rights. If we compare it to China, for example, it is really in the heart of of of, uh, of the EU and our values. But we shouldn't take these things for granted, and we all need to fight for this. And. Uh, that's why I would say that for the European uh, policymakers and democratically elected uh, decision makers, it is important to speed up now, not only propose regulation, but make it happen and implement it. So Ryan, what's your reaction to that? I mean, you've, there's a lot of things on the table at the moment. We've got the DSA, the DMA, the AI. Yes. I mean, I mean look, 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 let, let me... the Commission of not working hard at the moment. <laughs> 
no, no, I mean, let me just uh, respond briefly to, to, to Aura. You know, I think, I mean, I agree with her uh, to some extent uh, regarding the frustration that, you know, we are still fragmented. But, you know, we, we should be moving faster. I agree with you about that. But, you know, the political reality in European Union is that we have limited uh, responsibility, limited uh, authority also to propose specific things, you know. So this is the, the reality in which we have to live and work, you know. But at the same time, I want to insist that, you know, if you look, I mean, look at the roaming, you know, look at where we were, uh, I don't know, 10 years ago and where we are now, you know. So I think what I'm trying to say is, yes, we have to move faster, you know, but at the same time, the political reality, you know, the functioning of the European Union is as so we have to deal with it in a specific way. But now, uh, Jennifer, you, you, you asked about the, uh, you know, are we ready for next digital uh, revolution? Our, uh, I mean, what, what Commission has adopted uh, is this um, uh, digital compass communication. I'm sure that you looked at it, but actually we have very clearly highlighted what we need to do uh, very specifically in uh, European Union in order to be ready for digital revolution, you know. So, I mean, looking from uh, skills, infrastructure, businesses, government, and so on. So, I think we, we have very clearly tabled what needs to be done. And, you know, there are no surprises, you know, with, uh, you know, ranging from, I don't know, uh, if you want from infrastructure, what needs to be done regarding the 5G. Uh, you know, if you look at the uh, things like uh, uh, digital uh, edge nodes, uh, quantum quantum computing, uh, um, you know, all these things, you know, also uh, European uh, sovereignty in respect of the chips, you know, where we have a major challenge, you know. So I think uh, areas what needs to be done regarding the government, uh, the health records and so on, uh, and last but not least, of course, skills, you know. So I think, uh, you know, are we ready for the digital revolution? I think uh, experts earlier said that rev digital revolution is always running in front of us, ahead of us, you know. So we as regulators, we are kind of trying to catch up, trying to respond, you know, but I want to insist that we have the means. Uh, also, we have, uh, as it has been said earlier, the funding. Uh, so I think we, we, we as European Union, uh, and we should build on uh, our success stories, which, which we have. Jennifer, can I challenge that a little bit? Because I'm sorry, we have all possible roadmaps. We have really tabled everything out there. I fully agree with that. However, what we need now is to innovate, have these digital champions. We need access to data. We need data that companies can use. And us as a company, we are helping more than 400 million companies in the EU to have access to our data and use that. Because we understand how important it is for European economy and for European companies, for example. What we need is that real single market to make this happen. And the third thing we need is cooperation. And if digital sovereignty and building resilience in the EU means that we are cutting the data flows between the EU and third countries, I'm not speaking only about the US, and I'm also speaking about UK and the uh, rest of the world, basically. That is protectionism. That is not core. I really hope that there will be a deal uh, on the new privacy shield when Biden visits 15th of June, for example. And that will show that EU still cares about its, its companies and its innovation. And also what these companies need is, yes, financing. But I think financing actually is out there. Equity is not really the problem. Yes, we are leaning still too much towards banks um, uh, financing in the EU. So we need this kind of a big risk funds of course we have been talking about this for years if you remember the investment plan for the eu for example from the juncker commission times that's absolutely great but what europe really needs now is to be more open uh support free market and and have cooperation and companies like us i don't think that uh, the eu should see us as a threat necessarily because we agree that we need to have more regulation we want to have more cooperation we share our data we understand all this. So I would say rather use us and let us help European companies that only see us as a threat. Can I suggest that maybe what I'm hearing actually um, a little bit from both of you is more like a digital evolution and not truly a revolution because a revolution should really come at us out of the blue. If it's completely innovative, we don't know what it is. It's not just using 
the same personal data to do different things a little bit faster. That's not a revolution, that's simply an evolution. Um, there's a wonderful phrase that, you know, Edison didn't create the light bulb by trying to make a brighter candle. So I wonder, is it, you know, I mean, the, the, the accusation that regulation doesn't happen fast enough, you don't want to regulate things that you, you, know, you can't regulate for things you don't even know will exist that you can't even necessarily conceive of because we don't know what's around the corner. So I, I do think that, um, you know, maybe just pushing for, more access to to data at a, at a you know at a level that's uh, that's more international is not necessarily the sort of revolution we're thinking about today. I mean, we're talking science fiction here. We're not just talking about another social network. I mean, I, I agree with you, but you know, I, I mean, let, let's be let's be frank. You know, uh, as I said earlier, you know, and it is, has been it has been uh, highlighted several times earlier today by other speakers as well. I mean, we have our values, human dignity, freedom, human rights, democracy, rule of law. And a lot of those things, we are very, very, I mean, we are on the same page in the United States. But at the same time, there are differences, you know. Uh, we in European Union, we don't have the approach, if you if you have nothing to, uh, to fear, you have nothing to hide. This is not European approach, you know. We have the rule of law approach, which is very strict, you know. And I think in that respect, you know, there are specific differences between our regulatory system and regulatory systems like the one in the United States, which is, as I said, very similar to ours, to ours, but at the same time different, you know. So I think this is exactly why we have to deal with these issues in the right way. Jennifer, I mean, regarding your specific comments on the, uh, is it a revolution or evolution? I mean, I agree with you, you know, we have to have, we have to see here how uh, uh, innovation can be addressed, can address this, uh, you know, even small incremental steps uh, regarding the specific, uh, uh, sp specific developments in the society in technology and so on. At the same time, I want to insist we should not rush too fast into, uh, you know, regulating things because then we will uh, limit the innovation. Then we will uh, bind the hands together, you know, and, and uh, for, for uh, our and international businesses. At the same time, I want to insist that, you know, uh, we are not in favor of uh, limiting global digital competition. This is clear. And uh, we have... Uh, 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 we have to work with all our international partners. Um, for example, with with, uh, with China, with countries like China, on on the areas where it is, we have to work with them, but always uh, in respect of transparency and always in respect of reciprocity. You know, so I think by doing that together, you know, with our key partners like United States, uh, we, we 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 can we can change the world. You know, the question is in which direction. We will be working together in different frameworks, you know, either in the ITC, in the OSCD regarding and talking about the taxation and so on, in order to really champion our values and our approach throughout the world. So, Jennifer, can I challenge that a little One bit? Minute, because we've got a One minute, yes. Uh, rule of law. I, I just have to say that if you're looking at all 27 countries, can you really say that? I fully agree. We should have that in every member state. However, that is challenged. One big, one big thing from the regulation, upcoming regulation. So these gatekeepers that uh, are in the Digital Market Act, um, Markets uh, Act now, I fully agree that uh, GAFA companies like us, yes, we might be gatekeepers or we might be not, that is still to be defined. However, what the price that uh, these digital champions in the EU is are getting, so basically when you grow to be a digital champion, you will become a gatekeeper and we will split you. This is really interesting regulation coming from the EU. I think it's a contradictory that if you grow to be big, we want you to be big, but hey, then the commission is making the assessment that we will split you. I think this is something that we need to rethink a little bit in the EU if this is the price to pay. So I would say creating the right circumstances in the EU, making cooperation with the US and, and uh, other continents, it's crucial. And also having this real uh, single market in the EU, finally, that would be great. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop you there because today we are getting through so much and there's so much to discuss. There's no way we would have covered all of this in the 25 minutes we have. Thank you both very much. I'm sure we will continue this conversation on other platforms and online in the future. Thanks so much. Thank you. My Thank pleasure. You. All the best. Well done. Bye-bye, Zoran. Um, we're going to take a quick coffee break now, during which you'll be able to see a, a short video. 
You can also use the networking area to talk to your fellow colleagues and do keep sharing online. We'll be back in just a short while. Welcome to the future of Europe. Get ready to embrace a journey of discovery and realization to a place where the power to change the future for the better is at our fingertips. Brace yourself to experience three events which will shape innovation role models. Top industry experts, politicians and policymakers will come together to show you the new digital tech and health frontiers that Europe can reach. The European Liberal Forum will demystify how to boost innovation, how to ensure Europe's technological sovereignty on Earth and in space. Keep your eyes on the horizon to conquer new frontiers in the world of digital, health and hardware. Be part of the future. Be part of science, not fiction. Welcome to the future of Europe. Get ready to embrace a journey of discovery and realization to a place where the power to change the future for the better is at our fingertips. Brace yourself to experience three events which will shape innovation role models. Top industry experts, politicians and policymakers will come together to show you the new digital tech and health frontiers that Europe can reach. The European Liberal Forum will demystify how to boost innovation, how to ensure Europe's technological sovereignty on Earth and in space. Keep your eyes on the horizon to conquer new frontiers in the world of digital, health and hardware. Be part of the future. Be part of science, not fiction. Welcome to the future of Europe. Get ready to embrace a journey of discovery and realization to a place where the power to change the future for the better is at our fingertips. Brace yourself to experience three events which will shape innovation role models. Top industry experts, politicians and policymakers will come together to show you the new digital tech and health frontiers that Europe can reach. The European Liberal Forum will demystify how to boost innovation, how to ensure Europe's technological sovereignty on Earth and in space. Keep your eyes on the horizon to conquer new frontiers in the world of digital, health and hardware. Be part of the future. Be part of science, not fiction. Welcome back. I hope you had time to take a quick break, maybe a stretch, a cup of coffee, uh, and are ready for our next speaker. We're going to have another lightning talk with another innovator, and as well, once again, reaction from the European Parliament representative. So our lightning speaker is Leonie Mir, who is there from River Lane. Leonie, it's lovely to see you. Um, and reacting uh, afterwards, we will have hopefully, assuming we can all get collected. Uh, Dieter Sharanzova, member of the European Parliament and Vice President of the European Parliament, uh, whom I know is very interested in this area. But Leonie, let me ask you straight away, um, what are you currently working on? What's exciting? So yeah, I'm Chief Product Officer for Quantum Software Startup River Lane here in Cambridge in the UK. And in Cambridge, uh, we're very proud of our history in computing. Uh, we uh, are proud to have hosted uh, the ETSAC, which was one of the first uh, computers that was built after the von Neumann architecture, a revolution. And it ran uh, its first program in 1949. And this ETSAC, it was big and clunky and, you know, uh, quite, you know, new and everything. And, uh, but it was thanked in three Nobel Prize speeches. Um, because it ran such important scientific calculations that helped uh, scientists figure out chemistry, figuring out other important scientific concepts. 
Um, and it was also arguably the birth of a quantum of a software, regular software industry. Um, because it allowed this new architecture allowed um, the separation of hardware from software. So for the first time, you could program a quantum computer. Uh, 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 sorry, <laughs> I keep saying quantum computer, a regular computer without having to switch uh, to physically switch any wires. So what I'm working on essentially is uh, repeating this history with a completely new computing paradigm that of quantum computing. So regular computers are made out of bits that can be zero or one, and then those constitute uh, the, the basic building blocks for gates, for basic operations of your computer. And the quantum computers, they work with so-called qubits, which can be zero or one, um, or any superposition in between. Uh, and that makes them very powerful, but harnessing that power is very difficult. There's only about 400 known algorithms that give us a so-called quantum speed up. And specifically what we're working on at Revelain and what I'm working on uh, personally is figuring out how to take those algorithms, all these smart ideas, and actually be able to run them on a quantum computer on the hardware in a way that uh, does not uh, need any physical switching like we had in Yetzak, but that really separates the software from the hardware so we can have a thriving software industry in quantum computing, just like we had in regular computing. Leonie, that, I mean, that is very whistle-stop <laughs> description of a very complex issue. And I'm nodding, but I'm thinking, I'm not sure if I'm understanding all of this fully. But I am going to invite on stage now um, someone who I know does follow very closely what's happening in this area, and that is Dita Shanzova. Dita, lovely to see you. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, Leonie uh, has been telling us a little bit about what she's currently working on. Um, I'm going to ask you, Leonie, now what sort of problems you encounter before coming back to Dita to get your reaction. So, Leonie, there, there are issues. You must be encountering some problems. Are, are there greater issues that we should be thinking about? What are the what are the challenges for you? Yeah, I mean, obviously, quantum computing is a very risky technology. It has this enormous promise of uh, allowing us to do certain types of computation much faster, much more efficiently than with regular computers. And this has this has implications for all sorts of things. The the, the application we are most interested in at River Lane is chemistry, is um, so you know industrial processes, uh, questions of catalysis. How can we um, you know do chemical reactions? on an industrial scale better without, you know, as much waste, without as much energy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, and uh, there, I mean, obviously the technical challenges are uh, numerous. Um, these qubits that I was talking about, they're fickle. <laughs> they're not very well behaved. And um, there's a, a question of how to make them more stable, how to make them more long lived so we can make uh, so we can uh, perform longer calculations on them that are of more use um, to chemistry or to other applications. Um, and then there's different types of uh, hardware, different types of physical systems that can constitute these, these qubits. And for me as a software uh, person so working on software, uh, one big challenge is how to run a program on all of these uh, on all of these. Um, types of physical systems on all of these quantum computers without having to rewrite everything every time. Um, there are uh, huge technical challenges in terms of, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, correcting errors when they happen because, you know, these qubits being so fickle, they throw up errors all the time. Um, so uh, there are lots of technical challenges. Then there's obviously also an ecosystem challenge, right? Um, there is a challenge of how can software and hardware companies work together uh, in Europe, but also globally in a way uh, that is productive, in a way uh, where we standardize certain interfaces between different parts of the quantum computing stack so we can productively collaborate. 
Um, that is a challenge. And uh, last but not least for us, obviously, uh, as a uh, startup, this is a risky technology. It's quite capital intensive. Being a software company, not quite as capital intensive as a hardware company. Um, and, uh, you know, we do think that we will see big payoff in the next couple of years, but when exactly is unclear. So, um, you know, raising enough capital, uh, having enough runway, uh, enough kind of man and woman power uh, for a long time to solve all these technical challenges and these ecosystem challenges, that is definitely also a challenge. Well, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned that, you know, it will run, it be useful in certain areas. I mean, do you see quantum computing in, I don't know, 20 year time becoming a standard for everyone? Or is it going to be just in these very specific areas, be that, I don't know, healthcare, science, R&D, that sort of thing? Or, or, or is it mainstream, to use a very blunt term? <laughs> so we don't expect everyone to have a quantum computer in their phone or anything, uh, precisely because of uh, what you said, that um, quantum computers are only good or only give a speed up for certain applications. So they will be more in the background, like supercomputing uh, super at the moment is an incredibly important technology, right? Uh, incredibly important to our day-to-day -day lives, but we might not realize that because, you know, supercomputing, uh, you know, does all these wonderful computations about fluid dynamics, and that means that our airplanes work better, right? And But we don't realize that, or our industrial processes work better. And the same way, in the same way quantum computing will touch our daily lives, but probably not immediately in a direct way. Okay, thank you very much, Leonie, for giving us a really, really intensive uh, introduction to your work. And um, Dita, let me bring you in, because one of the things Leonie mentioned was skills and, and so on. And, and, and do you think, what do we need to do in Europe to foster the sort of innovative work like Leonie is doing? Ooh, are you on mute? I wonder if there's anyone on the back end can help Dita unmute herself. Um, no, Dita, we cannot hear you. I'm gonna give you another minute. Oh, you need to take off your headset, I'm being informed. Apparently it'll be it'll 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 work if you take off your headset. and reconnect. So, Leonie, while, while Dita's getting sorted out, um, what's your take on, about whether there's enough talent in Europe to do the sort of work you're doing? I mean, it's specialised. It's not like uh, every university is churning out hundreds of graduates working in this area. Um, that's true, but actually, in order to be successful in quantum computing, we need a very multidisciplinary workforce that's mathematically talented or talented in, a, in specific areas of engineering. And we have all of those in Europe. We have amazing engineers and we have amazing, uh, you know, mathematically talented people. <laughs> and uh, yeah, obviously, you know, the specific uh, challenges of quantum computing and quantum algorithms are you know, they're special, they're specific, but um, it's it's not like we would need, in our opinion, at least we would need huge programs now to like educate everyone about this. Um, we have a lot of people working for us at Riverlane who are actually not quantum physicists by background. We have a geophysicist, we have some a statistician, you know, and they pick this up relatively quickly. <laughs> so um, bringing this type of talent together and allowing them to work in this multidisciplinary fashion. That's really what, what we need in Europe, I think, um, in, terms of, in terms of fostering and nurturing this sort of ecosystem and, and this you know, skill set that we already have. Um, we're also very proud at Riverlane to have, uh, we have about 30 employees now, and we have 30 nations represented, many from Europe. Uh, we have people from Italy, people from Latvia, people, I'm from Germany originally. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and a wonderful kind of European microcosm <laughs> and and global microcosm working in one in one company um, and and in terms of talent um, I really don't think Europe is lagging behind it's more a question of um, having a bold strategy that gives us some direction and then mm -hmm. can sort of order this talent around a bold and big task that we all can concentrate on. Well, I mean, 
Can I ask you, did you always want to do this? Did you expect that you were going to be working in this area from a young age? <laughs> kids about well, statistics and things like that from when they're four or five? No. <laughs> no, no, no. I, 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 uh, I was always interested in science and I'm a chemist by training. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you, Leonie. Um, Dita, can we hear you? I think we're still having issues with, uh, with the microphone settings. It's um, somewhat ironic as we sit here talking about the power of quantum and we can't get a microphone to work. Um, I think, Dita, if it's not working, we, we probably have to move on. We've got other speakers waiting to join in the wings. Um, let's see if we can get you back after our next speaker, Dita. But, Leonie, thank you very much for sharing with us. Dita, I apologize for not being able to get you live at this point, but we'll hopefully be able to come back to you later in the program if uh, if we do have time and if indeed it is available because MEPs are working very hard on all of this and we appreciate the time they take to join us. We also want to thank again our sponsors today who are Qualcomm and Apple. Now, our next speaker is also going to attempt to answer the question how to make this fiction a reality. Bye-bye, Leonie. Thank you. Um, Isidro Lasso Ballesteros, who is the cabinet expert on innovation in the cabinet of Commissioner Maria Gabriel um, from the European Commission earlier on. Um, so I, Isidro, I hope everyone saw that because I'm sure you'll probably make reference to some of the things she said as well. Joining us also, we have Audrey Scalzaro Ferranzini, I hope I pronounced that correctly, who is the senior director for government affairs at Qualcomm. Thank you both very much for joining us. Uh, Isidro, um, how to make this fiction a reality? This is going to be one of those big questions. Audrey, I know you've obviously been thinking about this particular big overarching theme as well. Um, but Isidro, let me start with you. How can we make Europe a continent of true innovators rather than passive users? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. And also great uh, regards from the Commissioner Gabriel, from who you already presented her, her video with uh, her main messages. So certainly the, the way to make uh, Europe not only users and not only regulators of, of others, uh, uh, big champions and big unicorns is to be ambitious and not to copy what is being done somewhere else, but to copy what is done here in, in Europe, for example, where the, we have the, the, the territory with the highest percentage of unicorns created in the world, is in Estonia. So they have some recipes that we could certainly uh, study why they, how they managed to do that, so that we could certainly not be at the same level of the US of China, but overcome them. And this is the first thing, to not to look abroad, but to look inside what we have already working and be ambitious. And the second thing is to, to be realistic. So to realize that the digital uh, uh, unicorns as startups, we are almost insignificant. 7% of all the unicorns in Europe, only 8% of all the investment in Europe, in the EU, I'm talking. And, and then uh, let's start thinking on the next wave of innovation. The next wave of innovation, the fourth wave of innovation, is about deep tech startups, the science-driven startups. And there is where Europe has already a big potential. So we had to do the, we should start, you know, say forgetting about the digital startups. It's already that. We missed the wagon, that wagon 20, 25 years ago. You can see today all the uh, businesses that you have here in, invited today from the, 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 the ELF. They are almost all Americans. So Qualcomm, Facebook, or British, only one uh, German. So this is a reflection of the reality. So let's start thinking on the on the future, be realistic of what we have, which is our strength, that is science, and then let's start betting on the on the next wave of innovation, the deep tech startups. And there we have already be, very big champions in the world. We had the first bot billionaire, as they call in the States, that is UiPath from Romania. This uh, robot is a startup on robotic that he 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 made Daniel Dines he made the the biggest ever IPO in the world in in Europe uh, even bigger than the Spotify so why not to have UiPath here today with us or uh, GA drill drilling from Slovakia who is making Plastra drilling to do geothermic uh, energy at a price uh, almost one tenth of the of what is already in the market. Or I could continue with a skeleton, the the most efficient battery in the world, much more than the one of Tesla. But of course, we need to be 
as he said, realistic and also ambitious and proud of what we have. And this is what we have, and we should start giving visibility to them and making the Europeans feeling that this is done in Europe with our values and with our principles, and that the, the jobs, the wealth that will be created by them will stay if we do the right things in Europe. So this is what I think we should do, in, in my opinion, as, as the Commissioner Gabriel already said in her speech. Well, I think what you pointed out is that actually there's quite a lot of innovation in Europe. It just tends to be a bit more behind the scenes, not so public facing, not so consumer oriented. And I know uh, the, the other commissioner, Thierry Breton, is, is very much pushing for this kind of industrial data to be used since the, since the US has already flown ahead in, in terms of things like personal data usage. But there is a sense where some people feel a little bit threatened, a little bit scared of what's coming with the next wave of innovation. How do we foster trust in, in, you know, in the general public so that people don't consider it a threat or don't fear that it's going to take their jobs or spy on their private lives? Yeah, so there are, there are in particular, on this area of deep tech startups or science-driven startups. As you said, this is very challenging. I was the other day having a discussion about synthetic biology, so creating new entities that we don't know if it is a living or a non-living entity. This is, imagine from the perspective of the European Parliament and the Commission to regulate that. Where we will put that? We have our mindset split between what is living and what is not living. And we all know exactly what is and what is not. But in this kind of thing, so we need... So the, the first thing is to be aware, I mean, not to try to stop, because this kind of thing cannot stop. Be working with them from day one. So, for example, synthetic biology, we are also uh, leaders in the world. Start working with them, start inviting them to spaces like this or other things organized by the parliament or, or, or like, like the commission that Gabriel is doing with this group of the 33 unicorns that you may have heard about. And in these 33 unicorns, the, the big majority are deep tech startups. So we have invited some digital unicorns, but the majority are deep tech. No? So listen to them, work with them and try, if possible, that the champions, the big unicorns of the future in this new wave of innovation, they come from Europe. Because if they come from your neighbor, from the, the house nearby, then you feel much more confident that what will come from them is something that you can live with as well, because he's like you. He has studied in the same college, in the same school. So this is also very important that the future comes from Europe, not comes from elsewhere like until now. So, Audrey, um, I see you. I, I think it's a it's it's a perennial problem with, with this some of the platforms just getting getting connected, but it's good to hear you and see you as well. Um I know you've been able to hear a little bit of what uh, Isidro was saying. So what we've been talking about is how to make Europe a real hub. To make you know the theme today is uh, science, not fiction, but we're like looking in some ways at the science fiction, at the kind of you know, the unicorns are fictional, but we want them to be real. How do we get there um, as a continent, Audrey? Uh, thank you, and apologies, Isidro. I was not able to okay. hear you, but I manage to add smart technology and I work for a tech company, so I'm very happy. At least, you know, I have achieved something today. Um, if it's okay, I just wanted uh, Jennifer and Isidro to start a little bit of, you know, changing the mindset. Uh, I know that that was a little bit discussed before, and it's about as well changing the narrative. And I will just start before talking about Europe, just to talk about me, if it's okay, and share a personal anecdote. Um, so science and innovation are really part of my life and my work. Um, my husband is a telecom engineer, and I work for a company which is investing a lot in R&D. So it's like innovation is priority number round. Uh, number one around me and um, something I realized you know preparing a little bit some point uh, with you today is usually science usually start out out of fiction and I just want to give you a concrete example so I was trying to count and realize that I'm getting old uh, but 22 years ago I was in Paris in a very very small apartment um, and I was studying law and you know I had two major problems in my life at that time. I had a massive monitor on my desk and it was, you know, it was like super, super big. And I was always thinking to my husband, but just can't you fix it? You know, it's, it's even ugly. Uh, it's not easy. I've got wires all around this very tiny apartment. And each time I had to study something, I was studying law. I had to go to, uh, you know, to the university and do the photocopy. It was heavy. It wasn't good for the planet. Moving on 20 years now, 
this is solved and maybe we don't realize it, but we went through that. We had the life before the internet and many things has changed in our life. You know, we have connectivity, we have uh, smaller devices and it's a kind of just a kind of reality check, you know, but wireless and connectivity have, impact, have impacted our life in a great sense, in terms of education. I was hearing the commissioner before. Yes, this is here, this is around us. So just to answer a little bit about Europe and innovation, I do believe, because you know the, round, the world around me is full of innovators, we do have a lot of innovators and happy to share as well some ideas about next. Thank you. I'm fascinated to say that you know, it's ugly because uh, I, I seem to remember as well that in those days um, and my father was an electronic engineer and when Apple brought out those Macs that were brightly coloured he was horrified at the idea that someone would buy a computer based on the colour of it but it is about what makes us feel safe and comfortable so I think that is really important to bring it into um, so but it's also about skills and it's also about feeling comfortable with the use of this technology. So I want to ask both of you what skills we need. I asked the previous speaker, Leone, about this as well. What do we need to be teaching people and at what stage? Because not everyone's going to become a quantum physicist, but we do want people who can make the tools, not just use them. Um, so Audrey, I'll let you answer first and then I'll come to Isidro to ask you about that skills question. And I'm happy about this question, Jennifer, because I'm not an engineer, okay, but I know how to work with them in a way. And I think we need a set of many, many skills now to embrace technology. It's no longer something just belonging, I would say, to scientists. Of course, you know, we need them and engineers, but I think now it's part of our life. And the more that we can embrace technology is for everybody. I mean, everybody to be very inclusive, to really, um, I would say master how to use technology, but as well embrace, I would say the workforce in technology. We are seeing more, and it's not just, you know, within the Qualcomm world, but in the, I would say in the tech sector, we all see more like creative people joining, people mastering languages, you know, when we talk about AI as well, we need to have, you know, professor, we need to have people from different backgrounds. And so I think in a way we, we need to have a very diverse, um, workforce uh, in order to embrace uh, this. And that's a little bit just to uh, coming back on public policy. What we are seeing in the um, European digital, um, sorry, European education roadmap, uh, you know, having this kind of different blend of uh, knowledge and experience in order to really master and, you know, being in a kind of leadership role. Um, as well, something I wanted to mention too, it's having a very diverse workforce is something really when you can be very inclusive as a society and there was a question Jenny I don't know if I missed it or not about the challenges you know the threat the challenges and this is where we can embrace a kind of growth mindset too the more we will have people coming from different environment, different language, different background, um, different set of skills, the more, you know, I think we will really be in the driving seat because we do have a lot of talent in Europe. Thank you. Absolutely. This is one of the things we often hear when we talk about inclusion, we talk about, say, women or I think minorities. If you're not part of building it, you're not going to be represented in, in what comes out at the other end. So, Isidro, what would you say from your perspective needs to be done to foster these skills that we're talking about? Yeah, well, the recipe, in my opinion, should be composed of two things. First, uh, be realistic, face the reality, and second, be ambitious. In being realistic, what it means? That whatever we teach to the kids or even to the adults nowadays will be old in two, three years. That's the reality, and this was happening already more than 20 years ago when I was a developer. I was first learning Clipper, then uh, Visual Basic, then C, then C++, and everything in a, in a lapse of two, three years maximum between one language and another language. So I think we should uh, start from that assumption. And then instead of teaching specific skills, teaching how to learn. And I can tell this with my, with my kids. I have six kids at home. And the third one has been struggling with the, the results, with the marks. And it's because he didn't know how to study. So now you have a lot of, when I was learning Clipper and the other old programming languages, 
the, I had to learn with books, and but nowadays there is so much information in, in, in the internet, in, in platforms like YouTube, and unfortunately, again, not European, but that's what we have. So then using all these uh, kind of platforms and teaching the people how to learn, this is, of course, applicable to the adults. Of course, you might teach them the basic of cybersecurity or the basic of artificial intelligence, but teach him how to learn so that in two, three years, he has not to re again go to reskill, etc. But he can reskill his himself permanently. And for the children, it's even more. Whatever, whatever we teach to them, artificial intelligence, whatever, in five, ten years will be old. And we have to assume that, and that's the reality. Will be something new. Will be the synthetic biology, the neural networks. There will be so many things coming. So again, teaching them how to how to to, to study and tell them. Creativity is great, but the most important thing always hard work. You have to, ha to work very hard. And here I'm quoting what uh, Daniel Dines, the CEO of UiPath, said, how he's now the, the, the billionaire, the, the bot billionaire that I mentioned, the first one in the world. And he's certainly the richest person in Romania, most of these Central Eastern uh, Europe countries. And he, the, when we were having, Commissioner Gabriel was having a meeting with him, he was seated in a normal chair, and at the back, he have all mathematical formula, etc., etc. So he's a billionaire, and he's just, he said to us, he's just working many, many hours per day. So the, the the creativity is great. We have to teach creativity, fine. But with creativity alone, uh, again, the unicorns will be done otherwise and not here uh, in, in Europe. So we need to teach how to learn, and, um, and again, praise to the kids that the most important thing is to work hard. And with these two things, how to learn, and, and creating a, a culture of, of, of working hard, this ensures that the, the skills that they needed now in five, in 10 years, the, we will have them in Europe. But we need to do both things, being realistic and ambitious. But can we teach innovation? Can we teach an innovation mindset? It is. is it Audrey, yeah, either of you, can we do it? I think, I think it's difficult to teach to innovate. It's like, you know, do innovation. But I think you can really create an environment to foster innovation. And you do have some kind of many examples, you know, uh, doing that. But I'm going back on the diversity example, OK? Uh, but one of my, I would say, um, compass, um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, you know, um, a very famous lawyer, was talking as well about how you can have um, a very diverse workforce and how this you can really push, you know, a society. But I do believe you can apply this as well to really create innovation. The more you create people, they, they don't work the same way, the more you create something new. Just as example, if we go back to connectivity and giving as well an example, when we put a camera on the smartphone, clearly it was not to do selfie, okay? <laughs> it was to do many things, just as an example, okay? But this has been tremendously, I would say, um, kind of very important use case. And this is as well, you know, how you can have some building blocks. So I would say the more you create an environment, an ecosystem, a network where you can really foster ideas, then innovation is like the next step. And what about in terms of research and development? Are we doing enough in Europe to, I mean, uh, several of our speakers earlier said there's plenty of funding there. I mean, even especially now we've got the Resilience Recovery Funds and, and there's all sorts of programs and EU funding uh, projects that can be tapped into. Is it going to the right place? Is it being directed in the right way? Um, you know, what, what sort of what do you see as the R&D landscape in Europe or what do you see could be improved in it, Audrey? Um, thank you. I think that's a great question. And I'm going to give you one or two examples. Um, so first, we do a lot of R&D across the world. And as well, we have just decided to open a 5G and 6G lab in the center of Brittany, as an example. So clearly, you know, there is there is a very important um, attractivity to do it in Europe. But more generally, we're coming from, I would say, the open innovation world, 
in standardization. This, this is really standardization for uh, wireless connectivity. But this is where you have people from different backgrounds developing the new, the new next thing. And what is interesting is that basically the way you develop the R&D, and I know this is something which is kind of unusual for Europe, even if the ID is in Europe, okay, but it's still a bit this myopic view, we don't see it. But when you create innovation, coming with different company, basically in a way you can share the R&D effort because you are bringing the best talent to develop the best thing. And that's something that we have seen in standardization and it has been extremely successful. So I would say probably what we need, and we do have the funding in Europe, we do have the right framework. I can tell you that some of my colleagues in other regions of the world would like to have this, this policy framework. I think what where we might need to focus now is as well, how we can create more R&D ecosystem. System. And this goes with the developer of R&D company like us and many players in Europe, but this is as well how you can create a market. So there is, I would say, you know, this kind of fluidity between the, the R&D part, because it's extremely, I would say, uh, financially intensive, and what could be the use cases in the market. And this is where if we can have, for instance, not just people from technology environment doing R&D, but as well, I would say having people from technology and automotive, which is a sector very important in Europe, or fashion, which is very important in Europe as well. If from the beginning we start to share ideas together and work on some of the Munchen project, this is where we can get some leadership from my perspective. Isidro, same question to you. How do we foster R&D? I, mean, I think Audrey touched on it as well, and I mentioned the, uh, the funding that is available in Europe through the various EU funds. But I think something Chris mentioned earlier was also that maybe there isn't stuff, uh, maybe there isn't the sort of the venture capital side of it, um, but obviously that's not really within the gift of the EU to sort out. So, so what do you do to, to foster um, more innovation hubs? Yeah, I think this, the answer I'm going to give is valid for this question and for the previous one about teaching innovation. I think as Ori, Dorecho, can be teach, but you can create the environment for that. So the key in both cases is the ecosystem, the innovation ecosystem. And this is an idea of the Commission, Gabriel, to create this pan-European innovation ecosystem. Nowadays, startups in Romania are better connected to startups in Silicon Valley that to other startups or investors across Europe. So this is the big project of the Commission Gabriel in the area of innovation and will be like that, like you have seen in the in the in the video before. No, and for this, uh, uh, what we need is uh, the right talent, as we said before. But for that, as I said, we cannot teach different technologies because. It's kind of being wasted, but you can create the environment again. And this is, we have good examples in Europe. For example, Delft University, according to the director of the university, they have turned the university campus into an innovation ecosystem. The investors go there without realizing that they're entering into the campus of the of the university. I have to say, I, I have been lecturer for many years and, uh, uh, in, in Cambridge University, and it's exactly the same. The whole Cambridge city because it's a small town is the whole of that is an innovation ecosystem so we had to work on this idea of the commissioner and goes not only for the university goes also for the rural areas one of the main ideas also of the commission is the startup villages so turning the villages into startup villages and we have already some examples in bulgaria in croatia in spain with some startups fintech they have moved to village with one 200 inhabitants the whole village has become the campus of that company of course like a google campus like, like that and then uh, uh, talking about fine funding as you said is not a lack of funding what we have in europe by by no means we we still need some uh, big funds for the scaling up so that's why the unicorns group that met with the commission came with this idea of the tech sovereignty fund with 100 billion euros and this is something that we are analyzing and considering to see how we can do that but it's also uh, to again the create the ecosystem so that the institutional investors in europe corporates and pensions funds they invest here in europe just a data 50 percent of all the money invested in silicon valley comes from europe why the pension funds why the corporates go to silicon valley to invest instead of investing in, in companies there? why is easier for a startup to get money from telefonica silicon valley that from the headquarters of telefonica in madrid for example why is that is the environment 
is the ecosystem, is, is the regulation as well. So there are all, all this is what we need to work. And that's the, as I said, the, the main idea of the commission. And I would like to insist on that. The, the commission has said herself in her video, this pan-European innovation ecosystem to connect all the ecosystems across Europe and to allow this flow of talent or of, of investment to go freely across across Europe. So that, that's how I think we can create the environment for the research and innovation. Uh, and again, as I said, being realistic and focusing in the next wave of innovation, in the in the fourth wave of innovation, not on digital startups or, or the past, but thinking on the on, on the on, on the on the future. Okay, well I wanna wrap up by asking you both a question that I've asked some previous speakers, which is what are you most excited about? What technology, if you were to dream it, not something that's necessarily already there that just needs improvement. What, like, you know, do you want jetpacks? Do you want hover hover skateboards from Back to the Future? What ideas, what, what crazy ideas would you most like to see if you could just snap your fingers now and have something innovative and new? Audrey, what are your thoughts? I know I put you on the spot. Uh, it's okay, Jenny, and I really like the idea. Listen, I don't know exactly how to shape this new idea, but that's something I'm pitching a lot, you know, to, to some of my colleagues. And I think we do have an opportunity. I'm, I'm go in getting back to the public policy, but then, you know, to, to create the kind of horizon. I think with the recovery plan, okay, and this ambitious vision on green, we have a boulevard let's put it that way, of uh, potential impactful innovation that gonna tackle some, most of the challenges that we are facing, you know, and it's about, you know, our greener planet. And this, those are not words. I think that, you know, with technology like 5G that is enabling in a way to reduce emission, but the commission has launched a new project. It's called the Joint Initiative on Smart Network and Services towards 6G very complicated to pronounce but there is a big component in in it on you know what is next in green and i think that's something that is where i can tell you that the american are really looking at what's going to happen next and there is we do have a lot of startup we do have a lot of big companies right now on many many sectors that are really willing to invest in this so that's kind of my moonshot project i think we should go full speed on green okay Isidro, what's your moonshot project as Audrey very nicely terms it so the, the technology that is uh, has spared my imagination more lately is plasma drilling I didn't know about that a few weeks ago and I learned that because it's the technology that is going to be used to build the tunnel between Tallinn and Helsinki it's going to be three times larger that the, the bit across the channel between the UK and, 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 and the EU and, uh, and, and it's going to be using this technology. The technology comes from, from a startup in Slovakia. We are the number ones here. And initially the technology of this startup is called AG drilling uh, from Slovakia. Uh, it's used to, the, to create geothermic um, excavations, I'm not an expert this, as I said, I learned recently, and, and that goes much deeper than the usual geothermic um, energy sources and has the promise that with a few hundred of these, we will be able to cover all the energy needs in Europe. So this technology is applicable in many things on the geothermic uh, energy with really a promise that it could really allow us to keep our quality of life with a much lower emissions, etc. And at the same time, it's applicable to this tunnel uh, that is, is so big. And, and I'm, I'm proud, I'm really, I mean, this is a spark my imagination of the kind of things that we can do. And I'm really proud that this coming here from Europe, from Slovakia, again, not from one of the big countries, but from one of these small countries, that the ones that you don't expect. But there are so many things happening in these new countries. As I said, UiPath, the biggest ever IPO, bigger than Spotify, is coming from Romania. This one is from Slovakia. So there are so many things that happen in the, in the area of deep tech in particular, that they, there is, of course, everything that has to, with, to do with the space, space tech as well is, is always a spark of imagination. But for me, plasma drilling would be the one. That's very, I hadn't heard of that either. So thank you for that. That's a good point now. <laughs> well, I'm gonna have to go and look it up. That sounds great. I mean, and, and your enthusiasm is very infectious. So. Thank you both very much. And I feel we've come a little bit full circle from our first speaker, Georg, was saying that his dream project, if you like, would be to solve the energy issues. And I think, Isidro, we were talking about you. had the technology. <laughs> there we go. It's already here. Maybe with the technology, you never know. You have to try 
And that's the good of the startup. They, they try, they pivot, and they adapt. And yeah, let's see, let's see. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you both for a really great conversation. I say I very much enjoyed it. And we've got one final speaker left. Thank I you, think. Jennifer. Thank you, Audrey. Great to speak to you. Thank you, Itito. Thank you, Jennifer. Bye. Bye. So I'm, I'm going to see if we've got our final speaker connected. We are hopefully going to hear from Sylvie Blanco, Professor and Executive Director for Innovation and Experimentation at the Grenoble Ecole de Management. Sylvie, wonderful to see you. Um, you're wrapping things up for us today on the event. So uh, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> So, but basically, it's just very short. In a couple of minutes, tell us how do we create this eco-friendly, eco-friendly, innovation-friendly ecosystem? Well, uh, I think uh, first, first of all, thank you for inviting me. I'm very pleased to be here, uh, and uh, I would I really enjoy to talk in the previous sessions because really it was very interesting and the idea of uh, of dreaming and the dreams we had just. Just before uh, about the dream, the innovation of, uh, of the different uh, speakers, I think it's a good starting point. Um, then um, you are asking me about smart regulation, is that it? Yeah, what sort of regulation do we need to foster yeah. this innovation yeah. ecosystem? Yeah, I have to tell you first that uh, my insights are not those of an expert of uh, regulation, okay? I'm uh, uh, really, my insights are based on uh, empirical observation, years of experience in very high tech ecosystems of innovation because in Grenoble, we, we really have a very technology R&D oriented ecosystem. Okay? And I'm, I've been working for more than 30 years within this ecosystem. So this is really my background. It's not really about regulation, but this is a very important issue. So now back to the question. Um, before entering into into the what what type of regulation and this idea that we, we need to change things we need to renew something about regulation uh, I wanted to 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 raise this question and invite I, I invite each one of, of, of you and of, of the participants to think about why should we change and would you be able to say very shortly and uh, very convincingly why? why we should change this regulation so that we can think about the what we should, should change and what should be done. Um, for the why, if, if I come back to, to innovation and digital innovation, there are there is this 4S phenomena. You know about the 4S phenomena? Yes. 4S phenomena, I mean that innovation, digital innovation is different because the first S stands for speed. It goes very fast. It accelerates many things. And so we have to think about the life cycle of everything, the life cycle of regulations. Should, should we accelerate this life cycle of regulation? Then the scope. Uh, things are really very smart things, smart solutions are very complex. Uh, we are dealing for, the last example was excellent about energy. It is so complex, the energy field. So it is complex for each area, each vertical market, I would say, and it is in all these vertical markets. So we should learn from one market to the other, from the energy field to the health field to the blah, blah, blah. And, and, and then, uh, well, perhaps we should think about regulation with this, within this very wide scope. Okay, then there is this scale. It's local and then global. No, it is local and global. It is everywhere at the same time. But it is not the same way everywhere. If you look at this eye tracking system in China, uh, and then people come to us in Grenoble and say, well, you should use eye tracking system to monitor the attention of your students. Well, <laughs> well I've tried, I've tested, I've experimented the idea with, uh, with teachers, with students. And well, it's, it's very funny. It's amazing, it doesn't work like in China. Wow, why? <laughs> and I think we need here some kind of a um, global, because we are the global market. We are competing with Chinese, American, and all European institutions, okay, competitors. But we also need to have local things about regulation. So this is for scale. And then it was the last topic. It's about sustainability. 
we don't know nothing about the sustainability and sustainable digital innovation in that. We know about invariant problems, invariant issues that should be tackled. But we do not we, we do not know much about this. Nobody could really teach uh, uh, sustainable digital innovation regulation. So this is for the context and the problems that should be addressed. Then if I if I had to suggest in a very creative way what types of smart regulation, I would say co-created regulation by ecosystems of actors, experimental regulations um, that can be and that should be tested in the field and then refined and refined and refined. Uh, but tested in the field means uh, truly tested, okay? Not for fake. And then adaptive and systemic regulation, but very adaptive regulation, which is not the feeling that people have about regulation. It was a, bit, a little bit long, but I'm sorry. I had to, to tackle the why and then the what. Yeah, I'm thinking about, I'm writing down your four S's as well, so I will use those in future debates. But I'm trying to think about, um, you know, I mean, sandboxing legislation. Is this something that you're thinking about a lot? The, could you repeat? Sandboxing legislation. So getting oh, yeah. the spaces to try it out and, and creating more ways in, in working out how things will work in practice. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is really something that is... Um, is we are developing these uh, uh, ex big experimentation projects for, for smart innovation and digital innovation. It is really, this idea of sandbox is, is very, very present in these, uh, in, in these big projects. And we have devices, innovation devices, innovation structures dedicated to this place where you can have a, a lot of new things uh, emerge a proof of concept, uh, you can test this proof of concept. Um, it, it, one of the ideas while thinking to this uh, 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 sharing insights, I, I, I thought, yes, we should have this including in regulation. For, in, for instance, we should have this kind of dedicated playgrounds for regulation dedicated to uh, digital innovation, regulation dedicated to uh, data-driven world, okay? And these playgrounds are really places where, um, first of all, you can identify new talents that are ready to, to play with regulation, not in the, in the classic and conventional way, and that who would be ready to play with other people that are not from the, the, the regulation uh, area, with no regulation background, but with the, with the objective of being early influencers of new behaviors. And then people, perhaps there is something to change in the mindset with this uh, sandbox or this, uh, I, I like to call them playground, smart regulation playgrounds. Mm -hmm. uh, is it, we don't like regulation, <laughs> at least in France, I don't know you, but we don't like regulation at all. We are the people of liberty and all these things. <laughs> and, and we should look at, really, we should let, look at regulation another way. It should not be seen as constraint, something that we do not want, whatever the regulation. It, if, it, if, it, if it is really co-created, if we do feel that it contributes to a better, a more appropriate world for us, for each one of us, then we will play with it and we will be ambassadors of this new regulation. So this is really a change of mindset. So yes, of course, this is a good track. This is a sandbox. And how about fostering the sort of political will to get the sort of regulation we want, uh, or we want, I mean, that, that might be useful to Europe in the future? Yeah. Um, today, we have a problem. It's, it's um, regulation is uh, something that is perceived as um, developed in, a, in an isolated box of people that we don't understand. Uh, that people that who are, who are far from the field, who don't understand what's going on in the field, who are always uh, um, either too late or not appropriate. Okay. Um, if, if we can just associate regulation to a dream, I have a dream to contribute to uh, developing the cognitive skills of my students. 
I need some regulation, but well, I make an analogy with the vaccine. You know, there were there were there were a lot of resistance, and then we've been, we've been projected into a world where if you are not uh, vaccinated, then you are it, it's it's so bad. So it is a kind of emerging regulation that has been appropriated by everyone because if you don't want to be outside of the world, then you have to adopt it. And around myself, there is not one day without somebody asking me, so, are you? <laughs> okay, it's just, and a few months ago, it was it was totally the opposite way. I will never, you say? And it's just the same for regulation. It's a kind of regulation, this way that things are going on for this, uh, uh, this, this sanitary crisis. And it's just the same for regulation. If, if you, ex you, you are able to figure out a world where with this smart regulation, okay, that are clear, easy to understand, we can, just like innovation, if you want it to work, you, you have, it has to be clear, bring you an advantage, something better, observable, uh, you can do the demonstrator, this demonstration that it works, and you can just use it easily. Okay, demonstrate that this rule, this new regulation, these new rules are this, and that you can use it very easily, then people will become ambassadors. Well, a final question, because I think that's that's kind of actually that was the point I was hoping to get to anyway. In, in terms of regulation, I want to know we talk about Europe exporting its kind of values in a way through a lot of the regulation that we do here and thinking of things like the, the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation that's looked at by other parts of the world as a way to do that particular bit of legislation. And we see in Washington currently, everyone's looking to see what's gonna happen with the DSM, DM, DMA and the DSA, these other areas of digital legislation. So what I would ask you then, just as a very final thought, is are you optimistic that Europe is getting it right or is on the right track in terms of how it thinks about legislation in the digital sector? Um, I, I, am, I am very optimistic for one reason. Uh, this, this reason is that I feel we have a really a strong uh, immaterial asset in our values, in our history, in our background, um, because we are fundamentally, we are really a, a human-centered. And this is a long, long history. And I think that we have this, we have this knowledge, it is embedded into our systems, into our systems of values and, and the digital world is just very, it's just very often um, uh, something that is, 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 is not aligned with our values very, very often, okay? So if we are able to preserve and to use this background, just so it means that in all this investment in R&D, we should not forget these dimensions we should integrate them into our R&D projects, really, really. Then I'm sure um, we will be able to uh, develop really appropriate, and, and this is a very important one because there, are, there is a definition between this idea of appropriate technologies, and they have to include appropriate regulations. We have the assets, really, uh, we have the diversity of people, of countries, of situations, and, and then we have these assets. Now, there is one major threat, which is uh, uh, in the 4S, it's the speed. We have a problem with speed. We are so far from a uh, fast experiment culture. We are so far from data-driven regu data -driven regulations, for instance. You can just adapt the regulation, uh, not real time, but well, using real time uh, uh, data flows, for instance. Okay? We are really far from this, probably also because we are so uh, rigorous, scientifically speaking, 
are bureaucratic and in silos. So we, we do need to change um, our overall organization and structure. We do have to escape from the uh, technology um, load and it, we are still too much technology push. That's clear. We are still in our disciplines. We are, and this is a real problem. As soon as you are transversal, you are nowhere. This is a problem. When you have to get to, 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 to apply for funds for our innovation projects, okay, you need to show all your references. If you are already identified in the scope, then you have, you, you, you have better chances to succeed. This is the opposite way. If we have to think about disruption, we are wrong. Well, thank you. You, you, you wrapped it by saying, I'm optimistic, but then you pointed out a lot of things that need changing. So optimistic, but, but not complacent, I think. We'll, we'll sum it up like that. Sylvie, thank you very much for speaking to us and, and talking about the regulation in a really concrete way, because we've been discussing things in a, in a, in a very abstract way in some of our other <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I tried the eye tracking system. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank, thank you very, very much, much, Sylvie. And thank you very much to all our viewers who watched today for this science, not fiction event hosted by ELF and supported by Qualcomm and Apple. I would love to say that you can join us again on the 15th of July for the next in the series of science, not fiction, where we will be looking at the question of hardware. And I'll leave you with a quote from Samuel R. Delaney, who says, science fiction isn't just thinking about the world out there, it's also thinking about how that world might be. A particularly important exercise for those who are oppressed, because if they're going to change the world that we live in, they and all of us have to be able to think about a world that works differently. I hope that's a little bit of inspiration for the rest of your day, and thank you for joining us.